Brian Morris from Grand Rapids Community College. And we're up in Big Rapids today visiting Brian Gallup at the uh, Gallup Guitar School and Gallup uh, Shops of Guitar Building. And uh, Brian, do you want to just tell us a little bit about where we are right now? Well, we're located in Big Rapids, Michigan, and uh, we've had a repair facility up here for the last 20, 25 years. Over, the, um, over that time, we've evolved into uh, uh, building guitars and also the School of Lutheran, which is the Gallup School of Lutheran. We uh, move about 60 students through a year, and, and at this time, we're building about 20 guitars. Of course, the repairs are never-ending. So, uh, I, I see we have a lot of... Uh wood here. Do you want to tell us about that? Sure. This is the, uh, the shipping and receiving area and at this point I just got a load of uh, curly maple and this is all figured maple. If you look at it just right you can see the figure in it. And this will become our Gallup flat top steel strings and also mm -hmm. our electric guitars and it's the next for um, our arch top guitars that we're building now. And this is just good rock solid Michigan grade you know, flame uh, maple. Which would so be this curly. comes from Michigan? It, where does it come from? Right here in Michigan. Wow. Yep. The, uh, the upper portion of the lower peninsula, and this is all soft maple. Hard maple would be the upper peninsula, which is a tighter curl and more bird's eyes. Do, do other luthiers use wood from Michigan? or Sure. Okay. Yeah. Some of the best guitars ever built were, were uh, Gibson guitars, and that's why Orville Gibson landed in Michigan, wow. was for the wood. And that would be for the mandolins and, mm -hmm. and their uh, flat top guitars. At this point here, the wood comes in, it's at basically an inch to an inch and a half, and we cut it down and then resaw it. And I can show you the resaw a little later on. Okay. Also in the back portion of the shop, this, these are the cases that we have custom made for our Gallup guitars. Mm -hmm. And um, the repairs would be the next tier down. That would be, we try to keep about 50 or less in here, but it can get out of control from time to time. Also, as you go along, you see these shelves for um, the supplies that we use to build our guitars and repair. And up at the top, you can see that there's wood stacked, and that is separated by little uh, slivers of pine that we cut up, and that's called stickering so that air can float through the wood and dry it out. When we get it in, it's very wet. It's uh, at about 20% humidity. That's a, in the wood itself. Mm -hmm. We have to dry it out. And we like to get it down to about 6% in order to build. It takes about uh, an 18 month to a two year cycle of drying it before it's stable enough to be used on a guitar. Now I know you like to build with Brazilian rosewood, so, and yeah. you have a, that's, we're looking at some Brazilian rosewood right now. Yeah, the right? top tier is Brazilian. Um, that's something that we're stocking up on so that we can uh, build um, all of our guitars out of Brazilian for the next 20 years, if we have to, which is a very sought after wood. And then the next tier down, you'll see some lighter colored wood that would be the tops. Hmm. Sika spruce is what we use, um, Engelman spruce, western red cedar, and Adirondack red spruce is an awesome wood. Uh, in the backs and sides, we also use the figured maple behind us, koa, flamed koa is a very popular wood, and of course Indian, which is a great stable. Uh, reliable wood. Do you have some Indian rosewood too? Yeah, oh. we do. We have Indian rosewood. You, you can uh, see that's the next one down. Mm. Um, that's pretty easy to get and it's got a, a great supply of Indian right now. They've, the reforestation of Indian rosewood is awesome. Mm. Unlike the Brazilian, um, you know, they pretty much cut all that down. It was uh, managed terribly over the years. Mm. Over here all, in this area, this is uh, going to be the uh, the um, area of the shop that we're moving into eventually, but this is um, our arch top cutting machine. This is what would be a panograph. And the way that this works, it's a, a machine that's made by the Gemini company, and it's a, a duplicarver. They call it a panograph or a duplicarver. And what we have is a, a one inch balling cutter here, and this is called a stylus. This, is, this oh. mimics that. It's a one inch Kind of like a, making a key. It's exactly like making a key. That's what that is. And it's on linear bearings, and it floats really easy. And the way that it works, is I would bolt a piece of wood down over here and it has these hold down pins that would locate it exactly in the spot where it needs to be mm -hmm. to mimic this would be the interior of the front and uh, the top and the back and you fire the machine up you get it where you want to and then you lock this brake and you just slide this over and it would just go right down through and, and uh, route off or what we, uh, we refer to as wasting the wood you know because uh, this just gives us in the ballpark and then we have to carve the recurve on the on the back and the top so this is for an arch top. Arch top guitar. For a jazz, more of a jazz style exactly. in instrument. Yeah, we make mm -hmm. a, a guitar that's, uh, that's kind of like a Gibson style guitar. Um, everybody copied Gibson. That would be the L5s and the Johnny Smiths and Super 400. And this just gets us in the ballpark real quick and then we carve in the top and the back and the recurve on the inside. I mean the graduations on the inside. Mm -hmm. Which means as it, as it goes to the outside of the guitar it gradually gets thinner. Oh. 
Now, I know you said that you build mostly acoustic guitars. Then are these electric, the arch tops that you're building? Um, we build, we focus almost exclusively on acoustic instruments, and this mm -hmm. one will have a pickup that floats off of the pit guard, so it's still okay. truly a, an acoustic instrument. Okay, that's... No, no pickups mounted in the body. Hmm. But, uh, you know, today, even with our flat top steel strings, we have to look at the pickup systems that people right. need. Yeah. You know, we use the I-beam right now, which is okay. a, uh, a great pickup, but I'm still, you know, skeptical about all that stuff. I just like to make a true acoustic guitar that has a wonderful tone and let, it, let them go from there. Well, I think that's, that's important because I notice a lot of times it seems like uh, builders skimp on the guitar and, and we'll put a lot of electronics in it. I, I like to start with a really nice guitar and then, then add that to it. Yeah, that's where it has to start. That's mm -hmm. what I think. So, um, you want to show us the rest of the shop? Sure. Um, this would be the area that we build Gallic guitars and also repair. This would be the main luthier area for um, that's not the school, not associated with the school. That's up front. We can get into that. We have cases. These are the guitars that we're um, getting ready to build and move into right now. These are just the ones that are moving into uh, um, being produced and the cases that we're, you know, the guitar is going to go into. Um, different guitars we're repairing down here. We try to keep this actually kind of low. We don't want to mm -hmm. have a big stockpile of guitars and have it be a mess. This is the spray room. It's a very typical spray room. It's um, OSHA approved and insured the way that it should be, you know. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times the chemicals that you're dealing with are explosive. Mm -hmm. And nitrocellulose definitely is. This system, as you look at the pump system on the wall, that's a, um, a system that pumps it directly out of a 55 gallon drum and runs it through a heater. It heats the lacquer up to about 105 degrees, mm. which breaks its viscosity down and makes it go on a lot smoother. With every guitar, when you start, you have to start with an idea of what you're going to build. And I always just draft my guitars out. And this is a one dimensional picture of an arch top guitar that I'm drawing right now. And um, I'm, I always kind of have a, an idea of what I want the guitar to be not only tonally, but in style. As a matter of fact, I like to pick the name of the guitar first. It kind of gives me a direction, and I go from there. You know? Do you have a name for this guitar? This one I don't. This is a okay. student guitar. I'm still trying to come up with a name. Uh, when I come up with a really great name, I save that for Gallup guitars. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they get the, the other names. But this is going to be the uh, guitars that the students build. And on this particular guitar, they're making everything but the tuners and the fret wire. Um, the, uh, of course, the top and back and everything solid wood, as with any Gallup guitar or student guitar. But the tailpiece will be carved out of the wood, the bridge will mm -hmm. be carved out of the wood, the pit guard, which goes here, is carved out of wood. And oh. I can show you that, actually, okay. as we go on. I'd like to see it. Yeah, and, this, and they're going to cu um, cut this in pearl. This would be a mother of pearl. That's going to be beautiful. Yeah, a little, yeah, a little flower here, this flower too? here. Yep. Okay. And on the bridge is a little mm -hmm. flower. It kind of ties it all together. Now, what model is this based on? Do you, is there a particular guitar that this is based on? I would say an L5. An L5, okay. Mm -hmm. L5 is what everybody copied, and it's real hard to beat that guitar. Mm -hmm. I hopefully can change it enough to make it unique so that we aren't teaching the students to go out and copy other people. Right. But that's kind of a hard thing. But it's thing. nice to have a place to start from. Yeah, that's, and that's, I, that's what we do. Yeah. yeah. We start with something and go on from there. But this, this, you know, with every guitar that I make, we blueprint it and I store it away. Mm -hmm. um, as we move down through this area, this is the luthier stations. This is mine with my work area back here. Toolboxes that I've been buying since my, uh, my tool and die days when I did my apprenticeship back in the early 80s. I just love Gershner's chest, but in my tools, everything has a, <laughs> it has a place, you know. Like if I pull this out, these are the calls and, and uh, um, little fixtures to glue up Gallup guitars. And I know where everything is. Each box represents something. This is my fretting box. All my fretting tools are in there. Same as with the drawers. As you look, pan down through here, you can see this is our, our loose bench. If we have a four-day student that, that shows up for um, a fretting class, What's, like we have one showing up tomorrow, that's the bench that they would use. The next one is Sam Goodry, who is uh, he's like 23 years old. He's built Gallup guitars now for a year and a half. He's incredible. Hmm. And he also repairs. He shows up at the Guitar Center in Grand Rapids every Monday night and meets customers and drops off and picks up guitars. On the rack here, this is the guitars that we're building and that we're mm -hmm. repairing. This, the eight that you see that are numbered are the guitars that we're building right now. Once they, uh, the wood comes in the back, let's say I'm building a maple guitar, then I would process it through the resaw saw. Well, I'll have to show you that. But here's a Gallup guitar that's in the very final stages of being built. And this is flame maple. Mm -hmm. You can see the figure in the back, which is good Michigan maple. Mm -hmm. And that's on the back and sides. And then the top, 
mm -hmm. is uh, Sika spruce. And this has a bear claw pattern. When, when the lacquer hits it, it jumps out, but this is like a figure, like the top. Whenever I use figured wood for the back and sides, I like to choose a figured piece for the face. So when you talk about bear claws, you're talking about these, this, yep. these parts right here. There's an anomaly in the wood, just like mm -hmm. the uh, flame maple or whatever you might run into. And this guitar has a, uh, a, a bevel that's going to go on this. Okay. That's built right in so it's comfortable for the oh, person to play. Yeah, I'd like to try that. Yeah. <laughs> I might have one. We'll show it to you. And it's getting ready for the neck to be set. You know, I'll have this done this afternoon and be going into the spray room tomorrow along with another guitar. I like to spray two at once. Mm. If I spray any more than that, I can get a little overwhelmed. Here we have a baritone guitar that I'm making right now. A baritone is a long scale. Most guitars, the scale length, which is, has to do with how far the frets are apart, mm -hmm. like classicals are 650 millimeters. Right. The, uh, well, that's typical, 660 and 650. Uh, flat top steel strings is typical to be uh, 25 and a half inches. And I said 650 millimeters because classicals are carryover from Europe, so they're still using metric. Right, right. And we use, a, you know, um, English standard, which is 25 and a half. This is a baritone, which is 28 and three quarters. Hmm. So it's a very long scale instrument. The top is, has been sanded down. It's getting ready to accept the braces. Mm -hmm. The back and sides have already been produced, ready for boxing. Here you can see we have the sides that are bent. This is called the kerfing that's, um, that's glued in that, that um, makes it so that the uh, top has something to glue to. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you'd be asking the top to, to glue to a thin side, which is 75 thousandths. The top ends up being about 100 thousandths by the time we're done. Now, what kind of wood is this? Indian rosewood. This is Indian. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just good rock solid Indian. I've always liked Indian rosewood, but, but the, the people that we deal with, they mainly want Brazilian. Mm -hmm. but I'll build and, it. and the guitar over on your bench is, is Brazilian. Correct. 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 This is uh, our Solstice model, which is a very popular guitar. Um, a true finger style guitar was developed for that. Mm -hmm. It's a little longer scale, 25.7. So it's mm -hmm. another 200 thousandths longer in its scale. And the body depth and size makes it a, an extremely well balanced guitar. Um, that it, as you play this thing, you would notice that there are no overpowering notes. Mm -hmm. Where traditional guitars for tr traditional music, like the Martin series, the Dreadnoughts, and things like that, have a little more in the bottom end. You mm -hmm. know, in other words, they're very mm -hmm. boomy guitars. Yeah. Finger style people don't like that. Now, this is Brazilian. It's flame Brazilian. You can see the figure in it. And the sides also have the figure in it. And this is what's known as a flitch cut. Mm -hmm. In other words, the, uh, the back didn't come from the base of the tree and the sides didn't come from somewhere up the tree. Mm -hmm. They were actually like as they come off like bread. So they'll be a perfect match in color. And that's very hard to get. Mm -hmm. That's the uh, highest dollar guitars are flitch cut. This one also has the uh, bear claw stick at top. That's the figure top. We don't, it seems like everything I'm showing you is bear claw, but we also do straight grain sicka, western red cedar, uh, Engelman European spruce, which is also great for classicals, mm -hmm. and um, Adirondack red spruce, which grows in the Adirondack mountain region. Now, I've always heard that the bear claw was a better grade. Is that, is that correct? It's not really true that it's a better grade, but the bear claw only shows up in perfectly quarter sawn spruce, so the grain uh -huh. is running truly square to the top. Okay. But uh, totally, it's really no different than straight grain. Hmm. If, you know, if you're, uh, when you're choosing your wood, when we cold our wood, which co colding means that you're going through and you're um, selecting out your wood. Um, we choose for clarity and tone, like if you get for a tap tone, make sure it's not a crack in it, and also beauty. Hmm. And uh, anything that is uh, too thin or too weak, you know, we just, excuse me, too weak, we just kind of get rid of it, and that's called colding your stock. This guitar also is Brazilian rosewood neck, pegged overlay and underlay. That's beautiful. Well, this is going to be a great guitar. The Solstice is a really popular model. David Crosby just bought one of them, just like a month ago. Wow. Yep. It happens. It pops up every once in a while, you know, people buy guitars. <laughs> <laughs> but that's pretty much the size of that. Also, here you can see the back and the neck on this guitar. I was going to get to that, but here the fretboard's getting ready to be glued on. I've already mm -hmm. produced the neck. It's square. It hasn't been carved yet. Mm -hmm. and, it, and I put the balloon on the back. That's that little decoration you see on a lot of guitars. This one has stringers. This has Indian rosewood and, and flame maple stringers, which is, I like the looks of it, but it's, it is strong. Uh, that neck there being a solid mahogany neck, I glue in military-grade graphite shafts in there to strengthen it. I epoxy mm -hmm. those in there. And this already has the truss rod stuck in. That's the adjuster in the neck and then I can glue the fretboard on. Every guitar we make is unique. 
And we have about 10 models that we're making right now. That would be the Eclipse, which is our 12 fret guitar. Mm -hmm. um, the Solstice, our finger style guitar. Our Northern Light, which is our all, all around music guitar. A lot of the studio guys buy that. Mm -hmm. And our, our Strident, which is our traditional music guitar. And I'm moving on, you know, we get into the baritone, of course. And now, do you have a, a waiting list of uh, people that want your guitars? Yeah, we're back ordered right now for two years. Two years, okay. You know, they, they put a, a payment, which buys a spot in my calendar. Mm -hmm. And when it gets close to it, I, I talk to them more about what they want. And there are things that we do customize for the player. It would be mm -hmm. neck width and contour. Mm -hmm. But basically, we don't change too, too many other things on the guitar. We figure that we're the luthiers and we know best. Good. You know? But other than that, yeah, it's about, about two years. This is a customer from over in Muskegon, and he bought this. I think that this was ran over by a car, is what he told me. And we got a little dust on this, but the top was just smashed. You can see the cracks mm -hmm. in it, and this was fractured here. The sound hole was cracked in. The neck was busted right across here. Mm -hmm. And what I did is took this apart and slowly started piecing it back together. Mm -hmm. Given that the repair probably equals the value of this guitar, but he bought it new in 63, and it was worth anything him to get it back mm -hmm. and that's what I'm doing I'm mm -hmm. in the final stages now I'll do some touch up on the cracks mm -hmm. and touch this in so that you can't see it and it's back together that's a lot of what wow. I do a restoration like that and also just the typical everyday maintenance on guitars of uh, neck resets this is a Martin a very nice Martin this is a Brazilian rosewood one and I'm seeing the neck off and I'm gonna be putting this on at a little different angle it lost its pitch over the years so I'm gonna repitch mm -hmm. this called a neck reset that's a very common repair, even on classicals. They have to have that done at some point. Is that the tension of the strings that, that causes that? Or? We are sure if it's a tension. The tension has to have something to do with it, but we really think that the wood in the back stretches just a little mm. bit. Yeah, string tension, the whole neck just kind of just sags a little bit. This is our side bender. This is what we bend our sides on. I built this myself. It's a... Uh, out of steel, I don't know why I could have built it out of wood, but I like steel. But the piece of wood goes in here, and this and there's a heating blanket that lays on the top. I'm going to move around you here. Okay. The heating blanket is a, a silicone rubber heater, which is this. And when you plug this in, it has like a toaster type situation here, wires mm -hmm. that get hot mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. You put the piece of wood in there, you spritz it with a little bit of water, you don't have to soak it, and you lay this on top of the wood. And when you turn this on, this gets hot fast. And what bends wood is when you have moisture in the wood, then the heat hits it, turns it into steam, the steam explodes, which loosens the wood fiber. Hmm. And that's what bends the side. Once that's in there, then we take this and just kind of bend the waist in. And then we would come over with these springs and these calls, which would lock in here and just pull that around the outside and that bends the side. Mm -hmm. The whole process takes about four minutes and then we just turn the heat off and it cools down, takes a half hour and then it's set. So only about less than an hour to do uh, to bend, put the bends in the sides. About 20 minutes. Wow. Mm -hmm. So we can bend two sides in an hour, you know. But the process oh. of bending takes just minutes, and we can go on and do something else. Mm -hmm. Also above your head, uh, you can come around the other side and take a look at this. This is a, a humidifier. Uh, in a woodworking shop, what you really want to have is your your shop at about 50% relative humidity. Mm -hmm. Throughout the country, that would assure you that um, if it went to a really dry climate, mm -hmm. the wood would have a chance or a really wet cl climate. It's like right in the middle. Yeah. And, and when it has a reservoir, and if it gets too dry, like it will in the winter, this will kick on. It's just going to be water coming out. But you can see that there's uh, uh, atomizers. And it siphons it up and atomizes it, breaks it down, mm -hmm. so it missed that water into the shop and picks up to 50% relative humidity. That's extremely important for guitars. If you uh, build too dry, when it goes to, into a, a, a damp climate, the guitar will swell up. And most commonly, if you build too wet, in, in the wintertime, it'll crack and fall apart. I know some people have had some problems with some Spanish instruments. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why, but I think it's had something to do with the humidity that they've built the guitars in. It's totally. It's either mm -hmm. humidity, it was uh, too moist, or they built the wood too green. And, and mm -hmm. the moisture content of the wood was was too high. We like to see it down around 6%. And a very typical stuff here, the band saws. This is a router station where we route a uh, peg head binding and things like that. I have a whole series of these that just kind of pop in there and they go onto a shell. We stick it on there so that we can route those on. These are our binding cutters from my old tool and die days. It kind of comes in handy from time to time. That's why I make everything out of steel. 
but these are Porter cable routers and we made pantograph arms. And the way that this works is this binding slot has to absolutely be a perfect slot so that we end up with a 70 thousandths binding all the way around. And this is set up so that the, these rubbers are square to the table. We adjust this to get the, get the to uh, compensate for the taper of the guitar as this is four inches and this is three inches, mm -hmm. just talking. And then once you get it square, then the router comes down and moves around and cuts a perfectly square binding slot on it. So we can get that look that we're looking at. And I'll show you that on that uh, Brazilian guitar. It cuts up. We have one to cut the binding slot, and then we have two others here to cut the purfling slot. This is the binding right here. That's the wood. I always like to choose, this is koa and this is koa. I like to always choose the same wood. And then this is called purfling. Hmm. There and there. That is a 10 thousandths piece of ebony, 20 thousandths piece of maple, and another 10 thousandths piece of ebony. And up here we have 20, 20, 10, 10, 10. Wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And also we miter everything in. I mean, you can look at this closely, and you can see right there that all those lines line up. We miter mm -hmm. all that in. You know, mm -hmm. that's, and those are wood pieces also. Each that's one of those is a piece of wood. Yeah, that's 20 thousandths and 10 thousand pieces that we make mm -hmm. in our time saver. The, the other thing about having wood binding is it structurally is superior. When you glue plastic binding on, it's basically just hanging there. Mm -hmm. It's not, uh, not a true glued wood bond. Mm -hmm. It's just a, a mechanical bond. Probably cover up a lot of mistakes, too. Well, the binding? Oh, <laughs> uh, you know. But, but, the, uh, but what happens when you, cut that, when you cut that groove in there, the binding slot, when you glue wood in, it's actually a glued joint, so it's mm -hmm. superior in holding the guitar together. And the last thing, I guess, that would be important here, besides the general tools you see on the side, that's stuff you can buy, a few of those things I made, just special equipment, would be the, um, the buffer up here in the corner. You know, when you were asking about um, shellac finishes, well, mm -hmm. you call it French polish, mm -hmm. but it's actually a shellac finish. We use nitrocellulose here, but I am going to be moving into shellac on, on our classicals. But with a nitrocellulose lacquer, after you get the, uh, the, the build that you need, which is about six thousandths of lacquer, that's thick enough so you aren't going to wet sand and buff through, but not too thick to dampen the tone of the instrument, which is huge. A lot of manufactured guitars, the finish is just too thick, and it, it deadens the high end. But once that's done, we sand it back with a, a little thousand grit sandpaper to give it a good matte finish or get rid of what they call the orange peel. When you, after your last coat, the, it kind of looks like the peel of an orange, so you fl flatten it down. And then you buff it on this. This is an abrasive that um, the darker the compound, that's why this wheel is dark, is more aggressive, and you move over into the whiter wheel. This turns it about 1,000 RPMs, and once it's sanded down, oh, yeah, we just that's... buff it up, and it turns it into its gloss finish. <laughs> we get a, uh, what we call a 20 inch finish here. In other words, if you lay the guitar down and put a, a yardstick on it, you can look into the guitar and read up into the yardstick 20 inches, clearly. And that's called a 20 inch finish. Mm, so how far you can, I see. you can see the reflection. So this would be the school. And the way that it's laid out is uh, we take 10 students at once, that's about the max. I think we feel that that's really a great size. And on this side, they would uh, be here for two classes, either the journeyman's class, which is eight weeks, or the master's class, which is 24 weeks. And the primary instructor up front is Russell Olmsted. He's in the middle of a, of a class right now. Mm. And, and he has some students that are just beginning. So they've, they've finished their electric guitar, and now they're um, uh, covering the necessary lectures they need to move on to building their flat top steel string. Okay. And there are two, uh, two journeyman's class, which is eight weeks, and we have two master's class students starting. In the, in the, so they're all in this class together? <laughs> they're, they're, yeah. It, the school is laid out so that we can move students through at different stages easily without having much of a problem and still you know, have them doing different things or doing alike things. Like they're beginning their flat top steel string. Well, these master class students here are building their classical guitar. Drew is now putting his rosette in. This is called the rosette mm -hmm. um, on a classical it's common to see multiple rings or repetitive patterns. You know, like a lot of times you'll see the, the very classic uh, Spanish pattern where it's, where it's something that's cut up and, uh, and, and laid around you can see birds or you know, mosaic patterns. And we also have a master's class student that um, one of the uh, requirements is to design your own guitar here. They, oh. they move into business plan, uh, making calls, jigs and fixtures. They also need a system in buying tools. And they have to uh, design a guitar while they're here. We grade them on their design and you know, being functional, whatever it may be. I don't know. He's just starting with the fretboard right now. He's going to draw the body around that. 
So, so they receive grades for their uh, work? Is yep. That? Yeah, they're a test and quiz throughout the class. Um, and there's also a final exam. And their instruments are graded. Their calls and jigs and fixtures are graded. And as we move down toward the end of the class, in the master's class, we grade them on their deadlines. If they don't meet a deadline, then we grade them on that and say, you know what happened? Why'd you get behind? What are you going to do? You know, when your customer wants his guitar, that type of thing. Like, if you brought your guitar to me and you wanted it back and I didn't have it done, you know, it's real hard to understand that. You, you have a job or you just want to play your guitar. And that's kind of trying to put that in them, you know. Now, if someone was interested in, in attending the, the program here, how would they find out about it? What? Well, they can give us a call. Um, of course, we have you know, people calling every day, but also you can view us online at gallopguitars.com, okay. which will have a full uh, a layout of both the uh, master's class and the journeyman's class. Mm -hmm. You can see everything in black and white, which we promise to cover. Okay. In the, in the journeyman's class, we make one electric guitar and one acoustic guitar, and plus uh, move through a wide topic of repair issues, you know, like with fretting and neck sets and cracks. But in the master's class, you move on into tool buying, um, making the uh, classical guitar, which is a cutaway, and the arch top guitar. Back here, we have um, Adam, who is our apprentice right now, and we're cutting the, uh, the face on the arch top guitar. This is the L5 style guitar that you saw mm -hmm. the print of earlier. And we've already panographed, already a duplicar, excuse me, the, the top. And right now, he's just bringing the outside in to get ready to, to cut the F holes and move to the inside and start um, carving the graduations. Which means, as I said, that it gradually gets thinner as you move to the outside. At this point, they've already produced their sides. It has the curving locks in. That's the, you know, the sides are bent. It has the curving. It has the side braces, the head block, and the end block. And now they're making their top and their back. This is uh, carved out of big wedges of wood, and this is Sika spruce. And the back is. Uh, do you have your back right here somewhere? Could we see that? This is a little finger plane right here that is an ibex plane. It's made out of brass, and it's got a nice, um, high quality. Rockwell hardness blade in it so we can come in and just take that and move that stuff off. Right now we're just bringing this down to establish the curve that we want to see on the face. And that's kind of a personal thing. And then the graduations come off the inside. Move that down. This will take probably about an hour to have this in. And this, like I said, this is sick of spruce and the back is plain maple. And you can see this is wide grain, so this is western big leaf maple. Mm -hmm. But you can see the figure in there. When we get done with this instrument, we're going to spray it with sunburst. Very typical of uh, Gibson from the 40s. Dark tobacco sunburst. And the graduations will be off the inside. You can see it's already had the wood wasted, but now we have to carve this in, which means it's going to be pretty much, it's going to be a quarter of an inch all the way down through here, then it's going to move into 3 sixteenths in this area, and it's going to be 1 eighth of an inch all the way around the outside. Once that's done in the guitar's box, then we come back and carve what's known as the recurve, which means we put a little dish right here, which mm -hmm. thins it just a little more so it gives it more of that speaker action we're mm -hmm. talking about. We're kind of winding this up. You know what I have here is a, one of our Strident models. This is a very traditional music guitar. And we're talking about the, um, the curly maple in the back oh, yeah. that we're That's gonna beautiful. process. That's what that is. Just good, rock solid, clean flamed maple. It's got a beautiful figure to it. That's gorgeous. And you can look closely here, you can see the this has a deadhead back stripe. Instead of going all the way through, that miters down and around and comes back. Kind of a Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright thing, you know? Mm. <laughs> and also, the um, there's the stringers in the back of the neck. We were talking about that. There's the volute with the veneers. That's 20,000 veneers in the back of the peg head. And on the face, we're, this is the uh, power that's inlaid in there. Mm. See that? Wow. And that's a straight grain sick of top. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd love to have you play a tune on it oh. if you... Yeah, I'd love to. Oh. Thank you. Always love hearing our guitars being played. Mm -hmm. 